Hey everybody, welcome back to Parkitect. Today, with the Ursa Minor and the Black Hole in the distance, we have to take a look at Timber Creek, which is uh, a little bit of an unusual scenario, I suppose. The description is that this is a small plot of land nearby a rustic sawmill that provides a charming location for a few roadside attractions. The landowner is willing- wait, need to click that. The landowner is willing to grant you more space, but only if you prove that you're able to put the land to good use by attracting a large number of guests and you can't charge any park entrance fees. Now, I don't worry so much about that last point, but you may read here that you only get more land if you get a certain amount of guests, and this is where this crazy list of goals come in. But... <laughs> I pressed the wrong button. Hold up! Absolutely nothing went wrong there, and I just loaded an empty map. Here we go. So this is what we start off with. Just a very small plot of land. You can even see that the entire map is really tiny. So we're, we're somehow going to have to get about 100 guests into this little square, and then we get a small expansion to it, and that'll just continue all the way until we have 600 people. So it's going to be a bit of a challenge, this one. It's definitely going to be very tight. We're going to have to shuffle and puzzle a lot where certain rides go, try and build as compact as possible, and I think it will be doable, given the roster of rides that we're going to get here. So we have, of course, some smaller coasters, but also the monorail coaster, which is one of the best coaster types, especially if you're playing with a limited amount of space. But then also some decent flat rides that are also decently thrilling. So hopefully we'll be able to make something out of this. The theme is just a generic kind of Midwestern wooden log house theme. So nothing too uh, special. I think I won't have to experiment too much with that. It's really going to come down to the gameplay challenge in this map and trying to figure out how to make all of these hundreds of guests fit into this small space. So without further ado, let's get started. By the way, if you were wondering what that cut was at the start of this video, I do have save files of the scenarios just through me doing a little bit of beta testing while making these, so accidentally I loaded into that thing. Better not do that in the future, but you know, we're here in a clean slate, time to try something new and see where this map takes us. Now, obviously, we start out with very little space, so I'm not even thinking about building a roller coaster yet. Usually roller coasters are sort of my starting ground, but in this case, I really want to see if I can fit in some flat rides, get to 100 guests, then get some extra land and start building a coaster on that and see how to go from there. So I think that's probably the best way to, to go about doing this. But obviously I also need something of a food court, some information kiosk and a toilet building as well. So these are the, the bare necessities we're getting out here at the start. And just because we already have that starting storage building conveniently placed in that location, I decided to just attach some shops and stalls to it. And also that staff room, so that helps out a lot. I also realized just now that this map kind of resembles Silica Slopes from the original game, which is another scenario where you have very limited space. Some, although slightly more difficult than here, terrain to work with. And also a very similar theme with the kind of timber frame wooden buildings. I think the only difference here, and this is something that, honestly, I think I discovered this trick while making this map. I used the adventure pieces for the roofs, so you can see some sort of roof tile texture on these. And that's a trick that I've sort of kept using ever since um, I made this map. But this is where I originally discovered that they kind of work as that. Oh, and I also figured the original boring park entrance building is not going to cut it, so let's build a little tower. Kind of like you see in some of those South German towns where you have these gates at the edge of the city. One example I think is uh, Freiburg. It has a couple of these gate towers that look really cool. I remember one of them looking so awesome and like really well preserved from the medieval era. And then there's a McDonald's right next to it. I forgot which of the city gates it was, but it is definitely quite the scene. But it's it's mostly that kind of architecture that I'm inspired by here. Um, although I guess I did place a food court next to it, so maybe I took a little bit more inspiration than I want to give it credit for. Anyway, after that I decided to put a star-shaped flat ride down because it's always a great flat ride, not just because it looks really great and it's fun to, uh, to watch go around. It also is one of those flat rides where you can ask quite a price for people to enter it. It delivers enough of a thrill for the thrill-seeking guests to not start getting bored and destroy everything, 
So all around, it's a pretty good ride to place. It's also a ride that you don't usually get at the start of a scenario too often. So the fact that it's already here at the start is something to uh, take advantage of. This scenario has a lot of challenges, but research is definitely not one of those. As you could see at the start, we have already quite a few uh, rides at our disposal, so that definitely helps. And of course, this wouldn't be a scenario without a ferris, a ferris wheel, what am I saying? A merry-go-round at the entrance plaza, so that just after you go through that door at the uh, entrance gate, you first have the, the information kiosk and then a merry-go-round. I'm not sure if this is, you know, roller coaster tycoon history or if this is just really realistic theme park logic. I find there are many theme parks that start off with a merry-go-round near the entrance and of course information services are always near the entrance as well, but it, it tends to be something that works in games like this really well as well, so that's, that's, a, that's never a bad tactic, I guess. And then over here I decided to play a little bit with some symmetrical setup with this ferris wheel, uh, put, put it next to the river, have maybe a little bit of a view of the park, also hopefully when this park is a little bit more established and expanded once we get a couple hundred guests, this ferris wheel will be somewhere in the middle of all of that chaos, so a good place to look at everything. And also a nice little yeah, symmetrical garden setup with the paths here down into that ferris wheel. I'm gonna do something like a waterfall in the water between those paths at some later stage, um, but for now it's just a, a nice way to lead into the ferris wheel. It's almost like I'm trying to cram some of the logic of parks like Walibi and Disney into a very tight small space here, uh, and that's essentially what I'm getting at with this entrance area here. Scenery-wise, it's all still trying to follow as much as possible the, the theme of the original building, but I do want to add a little bit more, you know, variety to it. And here with this little roof cover over the queue line, I discovered that putting a couple of dormers together is actually a really great way to make a little spire, and it's something that I've never really realized. I've always put these dormers in roof pieces, or in, you know, larger spire structures, but never just the dormers together, but it works surprisingly well. I might actually start doing that a little bit more. Um, but yeah, for this building, I figured it would be a, a nice way to add a variety on the standard 2x2 building cover. You know, there are so many building types, typologies if you will, that keep coming back in different scenarios because they just always work like a 2x2 two two building covering some paths or a queue line or a 3x2 gabled building covering a, a zigzag queue line. Those are like the typical building elements that you'll always find in real life theme parks but also work really well in the game. But I'm always trying to add some kind of flair or difference to them whenever I'm building it. Um, so even though you always get back to doing the same stuff because it's just the winning team that works so why change it anyway? It's always fun to see if you can add some small variations. And I think the same goes for a lot of the other architecture in this park as well. Like this little house here brings back the colors and the pieces of the entrance building, but at the same time with different heights, uh, different ways of putting the wooden beams together and different details around it. So everything's just slightly different. Now, as you see, we got 100 guests in the park, and that means that we've automatically unlocked a whole new section of land. So as you can tell, you don't even have to buy any land yourself. Uh, and I, I say it, you don't even, but I guess it's more of a limitation. Instead, you just get assigned a new piece of land to build on, uh, so you gradually start expanding. So for this strip of land, we get uh, this whole part here next to the park that we already had. So this is part of the reason I didn't want to, you know, build the sides to be too closed off. You really have to, yeah, kind of work out with this map how you're going to expand your park because you always need to keep some pathways open just in case you get the land behind some of the rides that you've built uh, once you reach another milestone. So you always have to keep, uh, even though it's a very crammed layout, you always have to keep it very open as well uh, to, to add on extra expansions in the future. Uh, but for this one, I knew, of course, where it was going to end up, so I kept this space over here just to build this coaster in there. A monorail coaster, of course, with a pretty simple layout, the kind of standard drop, a zero-g roll into an Immelman, and yeah, a hill, overbank turn, small airtime hill, and then it's already into the brakes. Not that many elements, 
But I feel like it delivers at least a decent and realistic enough layout in this tight space. And besides, it's very efficient. It has nine car trains and it can do a lot of these, as you can see, especially in the time lapse. So this is going to have to be the money maker. This thing is really going to have to carry me as I start placing more and more flat rides because in the end with this map, I really mostly want to put different flat rides together uh, to conserve as much space as possible. I did decide though to play a little bit more with rock work and now that I'm doing this I'm starting to wonder why I haven't done this more in the past. Usually I stuck with rock work mostly around rides or around water elements, things like this. Uh, but here I figured I might as well kind of embellish these lines of terraforming with rock work instead because I couldn't really come up with uh, anything else to do with them uh, to make them look a bit nicer. And I'm actually really happy with how it turned out. I would almost terrace a whole map like this. I think the only downside is that it does take a little bit of effort and especially in scenario play, rocks are not that cheap. And if you make them larger and sink them into the ground, you still have to pay for the whole rock. And they do get more expensive if you enlarge them, so it's uh, something you can only start doing once you're making a decent bit of money. But as you can see in the bottom left corner, that monorail coaster is making more than just a little bit of money, so it's, uh, it's already uh, working out very well there. Now as for the station, I'm just bringing back in the uh, style of the entrance building, and as I say that, I've got another 100 guests in the park thanks to the monorail coaster so it can expand a little bit more. It's funny how when you build that ride on the, um, on the side of the park, you can see the, uh, the space shots kind of uh, drop tower, that's it. I'm saying space shot because that's what it's called in the Walibi. Anyway, when you build it on the side, like a diagonal park boundary on the water, it almost looks like you're building out of bounds because, well, the... <laughs> You can see that it's it's going over the actual border, but that's just because it it's drawn uh, diagonally there over the water. But it was kind of a, a funny detail. Like when I was looking at that, I thought there would be no way that I could place that right there because it would be outside of the park boundaries. But turns out it's still safe, so you know I went with it. Um, but it's also one of those great flat rides uh, to conserve space, but at the same time attract more guests. So as you can see. I'm already nearing 300 guests in the park without even having to add much more to the park. So at this point I decided I could kind of sit back, relax on the rides department and start building a little bit more scenery because the park is getting large enough with that extra plot of land once we get 300 guests in the park uh, to try and focus a bit more on scenery. So this is going to be a, a little bit of a, a, a thematic intermission here as I start building somewhat of a town on the side of the river. Obviously this is still a theme park so there's not too much space to work with to build buildings but I did want to build somewhat of a village-like atmosphere here and besides even though the other food court is nearby I figured it would be nice to have another building that's large enough to house a separate depot with some other food stalls and some variety to the the food stuffs in the park and also make sure that people never go hungry and angry because I need this park rating to be as high as possible so that I can get more guests, get more space, get more money, build more rides, and uh, finally, eventually, get to the goal. And because I wanted to have that sort of village look, uh, I, I couldn't stop myself from building a small spire here. Nothing too special, but, you know, with this, this wooden boardwalk-ish area overlooking the water, I figured if I was gonna make a small mini weenie out of here of any building, it's definitely gonna have to be this building, so ended up placing this here, and yeah, that's where we are right now. Let's just take a quick look and see how things are going. So here's where we're at right now, and as you can see, I'm making a steady bit of money, but I'm not really gaining guests anymore, so I'm gonna have to start working again on some new rides. But as you might notice, I'm also trying to keep some areas a little bit more open, and this is kind of my personal theory that I always like to come back to a lot, but I feel like parks that are completely busy, you know, don't really work out as well, nearly as well as parks that have some really busy and crowded and crammed areas and some more open areas. So with this scenario, I'm trying to create some areas where I try to cram as much together as possible, 
but maybe also some more open scenery focused areas like over here and just have some open grass just to get some sort of contrast and make it seem like it's not just a whole map with rides everywhere just thrown at random so that's kind of my uh, spatial approach to this build and let's quickly do a pov perfect timing thank you very much of the monorail coaster people are willing to pay ten dollars for <laughs> what is essentially a 20 second ride but you know i'll take it it's uh it's all very essential money for my enterprise um but yeah it's it's kind of like the the standard RMC uh, Raptor experience in a very tight, small mini layout. A little bit slow on this element here, but I think it's just doable. You get some nice airtime, some overbank, and a small pop of airtime into the brakes. The short layout also does help with throughput. As you can see, we're just constantly cycling guests through. I could even do it a little bit more if I extended the station, but I figured that would just look out of scale with the uh, with how small this park is. But yeah, that's... Uh, oh yeah, and also I put a little sign out here. I'm still not sure if I want this to be called this way. But this park kind of gave me faux German vibes, if you will. Like some kind of park in the United States that's trying to appear German. But it's really in the US. And I don't know, for some reason a mix of German and English in a single word kind of made sense to me for that setting. I don't know if I'll keep it that way, but... I always forget that signs are a thing, and they're one of the coolest things in this game, I feel, and very underutilized by me especially, so I'm gonna have to remember that's a thing and put more of them down. Anyway, let's get going, start building some more rides, maybe also some roller coasters, because I have been doing research, and see what we can do. Alright, so for my next project, I am building a spinning coaster. Because of course, for all of the coasters of this scenario, I'm trying to come up with a coaster types that can deliver a decent amount of excitement and intensity while not using too much of a footprint. And I feel like the spinning coaster is one of the easiest targets for this. Especially in this case, uh, I'm also trying to build my coasters as much as possible on land that is unfit for flat rides because I need all of my flat space to get as many flat rides and food stalls and paths in as possible. Um, so this is the kind of ride that you can build with just a low enough layout to have it meander with a few helixes over some unsteady terrain. So I figured it was pretty much the perfect coaster type for this piece of land here. Now at first I was building this very small layout as you can see with just two curves into a brake run and two more curves into the station. Eventually I realized that this is just a little bit too conservative. Um, with all of the layouts that I'm building I'm trying to reach somewhat of a compromise you know obviously i can't build the full scale layouts that i would like to build in a full large park but at the same time i don't want these layouts to be too obviously uh, affected by the the small amount of land that we have available here so i'm trying to kind of basically do what typical spinning coasters do uh, just a little bit less of it i suppose so whereas most spinning coasters of this type of gerstlauer or Marasona in real life would have three, four or five block sections. This one's really just two blocks, uh, two main blocks between the lift hill and the final break run, uh, which is one mid course break run, which is a little bit short and a little bit boring, but it feels like it's at least a realistic layout in terms of what it does, uh, the kinds of speeds it gets. You know, it doesn't go into crazy small curves or tight compact maneuvers that you don't see in real life on these coasters. So in that sense, I feel like it's a, a decent compromise to make. I'm also hoping that this coaster will be enough to give me another 100 guests into the park somehow, even if I have to push it a little bit, because as you can see, I am quickly running out of space, and space gets increasingly harder as you go through this scenario, because, well, you get more land for every 100 guests that enter the park, but the land that you get consecutively gets smaller with every goal, so... You know, the, the amount of land that you get when you get 100 guests in the park is decent, but the one that you get when you have 400 guests in the park is already a lot smaller, so it gets a little bit more difficult as you go. And then of course the final stretch from 400 to 600 guests, which is the final goal, you don't get any extra land, so you're gonna have to get those 200 guests in the end, all on your own. So I'm really trying to prepare as much as possible there. 
So what I figured I could do for this piece of land which I just got for my last milestone and which is going to be the last expansion of the park is probably just to build a launched steel coaster. Again, it's one of these pieces of land that's very he heavily terraformed. It's not quite flat enough to put flat rides on. Um, it's a little bit of an unwieldy shape as well. So I figured if I was going to build my final roller coaster anywhere, it had to be over here. I didn't want to snake it through any other areas that I'd built up or uh, the only other smaller part of the park that's still available. And the steel coaster is just perfect for this kind of thing. And it, I guess it's kind of the reason why I saved it for last, because it's the coaster that can most snugly fit into any kind of space. You don't need to put a lift hill anywhere. You just have a launch and figure out whichever elements you can fit into the space decently, have a break run and call it a day. So that's basically what I'm doing here. We launch into <laughs> a very strange inversion that I don't really have a name for, but you know, I thought it worked. It's, it's kind of like a, a sidewinder if the second... Well, no, it's kind of like a sea serpent roll. If the second part of the sea serpent was spinning the other way around and wasn't a corkscrew but an inline twist. That sounds horrible, but in, in coaster terms, I guess it's as close as we get to a decent definition of what this inversion is. I do think it could be fun, though. I don't think anything like this exists on real-life coasters, and I've watched many POVs in my day, but... Um, if you've seen anything like it, then do comment down below if I've missed out on any insane POVs, but uh, it's definitely a little bit of a strange element here. Um, but after that, I couldn't really figure out what else to do. I tried fitting in some more inversions, but it was just really hard to build anything through the inversion that I'd made. So I ended up just building two helixes and then one final curve into the brake run. And the brake run itself is quite far away from the station, just to make sure that I have enough space to put that rip tight there because I'm really going to have to put as many flat rides in as I possibly can. And I think this also comes back to the idea of, in a very small park, trying to concentrate some rides and buildings as much as possible while trying to keep some areas more open. You can see around the coaster there's definitely some space left. I didn't completely fill in every tile. But then you come down here and you have a bunch of buildings next to each other, a flat ride that is nestled within the brake run, and a single building that shares the entrance for both the flat ride and the coaster. You know, it's all very tight and compact. And at least personally, I like seeing these kinds of things, you know, that you're not really using every tile in the, in the park to its maximum potential, but you're really, you know, focusing the, the busyness in, in some parts of the map, if that makes any sense. Um, so this is just going to have to be a very busy and heavily themed area. I can also imagine that it's going to be a nice uh, sideline when you're walking on that pier from the village, as I'll call it, uh, down to this coaster. You can really see that tower of the station loom in the distance, which, of course, this being park decked and this being an isometric game, doesn't really matter too much because we don't get to see that perspective, at least not without any mods. and. Of course, I'm trying to keep this as vanilla as possible, but it's still the kind of thing that, you know, I like to think about when I look at these isometric parks. But also, I think this building nicely closes out the village that we have uh, next to the river here. And honestly, this village was very inspired by Shy Guy's old scenery. <laughs> it's just something that is is lodged in my head for some reason and I can never get it out and it's it's something that I always return to whenever I think of any kind of alpine but also Vermont like wooden style American architecture. His custom scenery sets from Rollercoast Tycoon are still influencing me today and it's it's funny honestly how he's even returned uh, to form in, in Park Tech and made some amazing sets for this game as well which Again, given the fact that I'm playing vanilla on these scenarios is something that I'm not using, but his Shy Guys uh, Alpine Village work in Park Tech is amazing as well. I get the question so often when I'm actually going to do something sandbox in Park Tech, and I'm sorry if I've talked about this a little bit too much, but uh, I feel like I might as well segue into this topic. It's something that I would like to do at some point in the future, but I really want to finish the scenarios first, so... For now, it's out of the question, but it's it's definitely something that I want to try in the future, especially if and when I do run out of scenarios to play, so that's uh, that's something I'm playing for the long con. 
Um, also, I'm pretty sure I just forgot to mention that I built a flat ride there. Uh, but yeah, I built the, the big loop-de-loop -loop flat ride uh, in that corner of the park. And that pretty much fills up the entire scenario. At this point, all I'm still doing is adding some final touches. Waiting for the countdown to reach 600 guests, which I think I'll comfortably reach. Uh, especially given the fact that I'm running some advertisements now, so I'll see some extra people come in. Uh, the looping coaster, or I should say the steel coaster, is very good at drawing in extra guests, so that's really nice as well. So at this point, I really just have to pause the game sometimes, make sure I'm not reaching the call too quickly, like I did in Candyland, and trying to, to fill all of the nooks and crannies and, and finish the last little bits of this park before I, uh, before I reach the end goal. So nothing too spectacular happening here, I decided to add one more toilet building uh, next to the, the launch drop tower, uh, just because I, I only had one sort of near the entrance and I felt like it would fit to, to put one in there as well. I think it's also good to have two different court, uh, food courts in this scenario, so we have one in the village as well. It's just something to, to make people go to that area and sit on the benches and have some food. Sometimes, you know, it's not even all about the, the gameplay uh, part of it, but just about how it looks. And it's always nice to have different food courts uh, throughout your park and just see people enjoying their day. And finally, my, my last touch, which is kind of unusual for me to build a coaster and then actually finish it later on, I decided to build a station for the spinning coaster. And this is a square station. Doesn't happen a lot, but you know, this being a spinning coaster, you don't need a huge station for it, mostly some block sections. So I decided to put some simple cap shaped roof on that little spire. And uh, finally, we have a seating area. This is actually, I think, the, the second seating area already for this scenario. Just some benches and a path and a roof over it to take in the views around you. And that's basically it. So let's go back and see how it turned out. All right, so there we are. I'm not gonna let another Candyland scenario happen this time. Oh. Now, there we go. All right, perfect. I like how every scenario is actually an achievement on Steam as well. That's very funny. Anyway, we made it. Um, although we didn't make it by the end of October year two, I actually didn't notice. Oops. Oh, that's very difficult. Alright, didn't get the optional goals this time then, uh, but at least I made it, and honestly I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. Given the goals of this scenario, I don't think it's particularly hard to finish the scenario, uh, but I did see a bit of a challenge in finishing it in a decent manner, where the park doesn't look you know, too <laughs> rollercoaster tycoon micro parky. Um, but I think this, uh, this manages to strike a balance. Let's do a quick POV of the spinning coaster, and by quick I really mean quick because it's it's not the biggest coaster ever, but I feel like it, it does a decent amount of stuff in its layout. And then we get to that small brake run. It's almost like a station flyby, honestly, at this point. And a flyover over the water, which actually does spin the best for uh, most of the ride. These, these cars don't actually spin as much, and to be honest, I haven't done a test, but it seems to me like they spin a little bit less than the Gerslauer cars. Uh, these are the, the real-life equivalent Maurer Sona cars, uh, whereas with Gerstlauer you're sitting uh, in, in, a, in an eye-to-eye -eye seating, two across, which is really fun if you're with friends, but a little bit awkward if you're with strangers, so I, I kind of prefer these, depending on who you're with, I suppose. Uh, and then we get the steel coaster. We'll get to that in a minute, if we can actually do a, a full POV. But yeah, all things considered, I'm pretty happy with how it worked out. It really does kind of have that village vibe with the river going through the middle here. Ooh, I think we, we really have to do a POV of here now. Uh, pretty sure I set the timing on this station to be quite short. Um, but maybe it's not short enough. Any second now? Alright, we'll see how that goes. I, I do feel a little bit bad for these people in the break run. Ah, there we go. I just wanted to have as much throughput as possible because as you can see, I am reaching maximum capacity on this ride, so I need to get as much throughput as I can. And honestly, it doesn't occur too often that in Parkitect I managed to hit the maximum capacity of any roller coaster, but here it happened. I mean, the, the spinning coaster is a bit of uh, an exception because it, of course, doesn't have a huge capacity. 
And this one does have a pretty decent throughput because it has two trains and a very short layout. But you know, stuff happens. I am making a very good amount of profit. I also noticed $3,000 a month is not something that I usually hit. So that's really, really cool to see as well. But yeah, that's, uh, that's basically Timber Creek. Let's go back to the main menu and see what we end up getting as a trophy. I suspect it's probably the, the sawmill. Right, there we go. Makes sense. All right, so let's see what we get for the next one. Mm. <laughs> God, this is such a reveal. Oh, yeah, I know what this is. Jungle Adventure. All right, I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching and take care. Bye-bye.